Okay, I believe it's time for another Thursday Live with me, Steve Wahlberg, and with you, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, thank you for joining us. I always like these, these live events, and I, I'm sure those who uh, join us regularly, you like them too, or you wouldn't be joining us. So God is good. I hope you're blessed today. I'm doing, I'm doing fine here in North Idaho. It's been kind of a, oh, an intense day. I always have a lot of things going on at the office, emails to answer and different things to sort out and deal with. And we had a good uh, meeting this morning with our staff. We start out uh, every workday, Monday through Thursday, with a time of uh, Bible study and a time of prayer. We did that today. We have a lot of things on our plates, a lot of things to pray for people that we love, people that we care about, that we're praying for, uh, different people that have different quirks going on in their bodies that need prayer, some people with uh, car issues, some people with um, relationship issues. Um, we had one uh, a dog got attacked, I think, by a cougar, and, and uh, that was it. So that was a sad moment for uh, one of our group here. And but anyway, in the midst of everything, we are learning to be thankful, to trust in Jesus. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, our topic today is called Our Greatest Need, which I will be identifying in just a little bit. And as I like to, I always like to do this, I like to just uh, read some of the names and um, some of the places where you're from. So if you haven't given me that information, uh, you're welcome just to put that in the chat, we have Lewis, and it looks like Carla, both of them, in Florida. I think you're regulars to this uh, live event. And then uh, it says Analytic Critic, but I know who that is. Uh, and she's coming from Wisconsin. And Susan in New York. And Scott in North Carolina. Let's see, do I have any others that haven't given me or have just given me where they're from? I don't know. We typically have people that also come in from sometimes Thailand, Philippines, Australia. Okay, LC says tuning in from uh, Nebraska. Linda, USVI. What is USVI? I'm sorry about that. I don't know exactly what that means. But anyway, I'm sure uh, it means something. It's somewhere. So thank you for joining us. Uh, God is good. The Lord is good all the time. So, um, if you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Okay, Linda is coming in from St. Thomas, uh, the island. Lottie from the ATL area, which I believe means Atlanta. Hope I've got that right. So, praise the Lord. Uh, we're, we've got a great Bible study in store. And before we get into our study, let me just mention a couple of our resources. We're going to be talking about uh, the topic ties in with this book. It's a White Horse Media book. I wrote it. It's been out for a few months called Satan's War Against the Godhead, which deals with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, this book is rather controversial, but I believe it's straight as an arrow biblically, and it will enlighten those who are wrestling with this issue of uh, who is the Son in relation to the Father? And what about the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Or what does the Bible really teach? Now, we have another book that just came out, brand new, called Israel and the End of the World, that deals with uh, what's happening in the Middle East and what does the Bible, and especially the book of Revelation, say about Israel, Jerusalem, the Jews, the Temple, and the final battle of Armageddon. So if you are... If you have questions about this topic, I can't recommend this book strongly enough. Uh, if you're not in the States and you can't order it from White Horse Media, uh, there is uh, a version of this book that is on, on Amazon, which is called False Prophecies About Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon. So anyway, it's not a, not a big book, and the price is way low. We've had a big print run, 250,000 copies of this book. And the prices go all the way down to 99 cents if you buy them in bulk. So if you want to learn more about that, you can contact White Horse Media. We've got a lot of these books. People are sharing them, giving them away. 
and uh, people are being blessed. <clears throat> so our topic today is our greatest need. So let's pray that God will help us as we dive in to the book of Revelation and to another, another passage in the book of Luke and talk about this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, keeping us alive all throughout our lives in spite of many dangers, toils, and snares. Many of us have been through many trials and challenges, and some of us are going through trials and challenges right now. And Lord, we just pray that you will help us. We all need your help. We all have need for Jesus. And so we pray uh, that you will bless us and help us and open our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Our greatest need. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. This is the beginning of the book, or the first chapter. And John wrote, I, John... I'm also your brother and your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ. I was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then he says, I was, and what does it say right after that? John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And that's when he got this book. Uh, the entire book of Revelation and the blessing that it has been to so many for so long was given to a man named John on an island called Patmos when he was in the spirit. Uh, and this is just critical. Uh, there's no way for John to receive revelations from God, to understand any of those revelations, uh, or for us to really understand the deep things of God unless we uh, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to focus on. This is a, a big topic. It's one that, that really means a lot to me personally, because as I look back on my life, uh, there was a time when I was uh, really in, in a dark place. And I'm not going to go into those details, but what got me out of this was uh, a conviction that just came to my mind in the middle of my drama it was a still small voice that impressed me to, to begin to pray for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth, which is a quote from John 16, verse 13. And that was in 1986 when that happened. And for 30, approximately 37 years, I have been praying and praying and praying and praying. And I keep praying and I'll keep on praying for more and more of the Holy Spirit of my life. And this really has changed me in more ways than I can, I can, uh, can explain. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is our greatest need, that we need him in our lives so that we can understand the Bible, so we can understand Jesus, so we can understand the plan of salvation, so we can fight against the devil, so we can um, deal with the battle uh, against sin, and by God's grace, we can overcome sin. Uh, the Holy Spirit teaches us what to do in different situations where we don't know what to do. So the, and, and the Bible, and especially the book of Revelation, it talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. So let's just take a look at a few verses. Uh, in chapter 2, in verse 7, at the end of the message of Jesus to the church of Ephesus, Jesus said, He that has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so there's a, a reference to the Holy Spirit. In verse 11, at the end, or verse 11 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now going to the third church, if you look at verse, uh, where is that verse? Pergamos, uh, at verse 17. At the end of uh, Pergamos, verse 17 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You go down to verse 29. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3, at the end of the message to the 
Church of Sardis. Verse 13 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, I'm sorry, that was uh, Philadelphia. At the, end of, at the end of Sardis in verse 6, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Same thing with the end of verse at the end of the Laodicean message in verse 22, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again and again and again, when Jesus gives these messages to his church, he ends his messages with an, with an appeal, uh, with a statement that those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Now notice verse, uh, verse 18, chapter 3, verse 18. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white clothes that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The eye salve is the Holy Spirit. So here Jesus is talking to the Laodicean church, which is the seventh church, the last church in the sequence of seven, uh, representing the final church of God before the coming of Jesus. And uh, we actually just did an, uh, a whole, we just did a three-part series called God's Last Message to His Church. We recorded this yesterday. And they're being edited right now. They'll be on our YouTube channel soon. They'll be on uh, 3ABN, we're sending it out to our, our list of radio and television networks, which is a growing list. We're excited about that. And, and uh, this series with me and Rob Knott just walks people verse by verse by verse through Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 12, which is Jesus' message to the Laodicean church. And in that uh, message, Jesus says that uh, people in, in that church, are they're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm, which means they're very satisfied with, with their condition, and yet they need everything. And then he said uh, that they say, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, but they don't realize their, their true condition, their spiritual, uh, their, their need. It says they, they think they have need of nothing. And then he says, but they don't realize that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, which uh, I apply to myself and and I've learned that the Lord is talking to me in that passage and that I have a great need for Christ that without Jesus I'm really poor I'm blind I'm naked uh, I'm in I'm, de I'm in des desperate need of a savior and then in verse 18 he offers the remedy which is the gold of faith and love and the white garments of his pure spotless righteousness and then the last thing is the eye salve. Uh, he says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And the eye salve, again, is the Holy Spirit. And it's only when the eye salve of the Holy Spirit uh, comes, you know, comes, comes upon us, that anointing, that we are able to see our true condition and we're able to see our need for Jesus and we're able to see uh, how wonderful he is and how powerful he is and how full of grace he is and how able he is to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him. That no matter how bad we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what our uh, deep soul poverty, uh, Jesus is more than able to save us by his grace. He loves us. He loves sinners. And he is uh, he's happy to find people who feel a need for him. Uh, and I guess we could say that our greatest need is for Jesus Christ. But the only way that we will even feel a need for Jesus and see our true condition is through the eye salve of the Holy Spirit. And that is just, so that's why I say that the Holy Spirit is our greatest need to help us to realize that Jesus is our greatest need and to help us to humbly rely on him and to trust him with our whole heart. Now, let me show you a few more verses about the Holy Spirit. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. Uh, John would not have been able to 
to see the throne of God and the one who was sitting on the throne if he wasn't in the spirit. You have to be in the spirit in order to understand the things of God. Now, if you look at chapter 17, in chapter 4, John saw the throne room. He saw the 24 elders. He saw uh, the lamb who had been slain. That was in chapter 5. And then in chapter 17, he sees the harlot. Revelation 17, verse 3 says, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So John was in the spirit when he got the book of Revelation. Jesus ended every message of the seven churches with an appeal for us to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. Uh, in Revelation chapter 4, John is in the spirit and he sees the throne room. He sees God sitting on his throne and, and all the, or at least a lot of the things that are happening up in, in heaven. And then in chapter 17, he is again carried away in the spirit into the wilderness where he sees this woman, this wicked woman named Babylon. She's the mother of harlots. And uh, because she's the mother, because the Bible says she's the mother of harlots, that means she's not the only harlot. She has daughters uh, that come out of her, daughter churches that come out of the mother. And eventually they're considered to be daughters because they do what the mother does. Uh, they follow in the footsteps of the, of the mother, like mom, like, like daughters. And, and again, the only way that John was able to see any of this was through the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in verse 3. And at the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come, and let him who is thirsty come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So Revelation chapter 1 opens with John being in the Spirit, and Revelation chapter 22 closes with an appeal of the Holy Spirit. So I, th I think we should all be able to see that when we look at all these verses in the book of Revelation, it's very, very clear that the Holy Spirit is, is uh, a major part of the book of Revelation. And my conviction is that people cannot understand the last book of the Bible and its great truths about the three angels' messages and about a remnant that keeps the commandments of God and has the testament of Jesus and about the dragon and the beast and the false prophet and the mark of the beast and the harlot uh, and her daughters, and the Laodicean message, and, and uh, the importance of overcoming our self-sufficiency and our pride, and having the white clothes of Christ's righteousness, and having the gold of faith and love. Uh, all these things are not comprehensible unless we have the eye salve anointing our eyes so that we, like Jesus said, so we can see. Uh, it's like glasses, you know, I, I need my, I don't really, I don't need glasses when I walk around regularly. Uh, I'm kind of at that age right now with, based on the condition of my eyes. I can still see uh, just when I, you know, walk around from place to place. But whenever I want to read something, like if I want to read the Bible, I, I cannot, I can't see these words well enough to read my Bible. I've got a monitor here next to me that's where everything is bigger, so it's easier for me to see if I want to take comments. But I've got to have my glasses on. If I don't have my glasses on, I can't read. I can't see the words on the page. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. If I don't have the Holy Spirit in my life, I am not able to see the things of God. I can't see my own need. I can't see my own condition. I can't see uh, the hidden sins in my life or the defects in my character where, like David said, uh, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. 
So David recognized that there's things inside of him that we can't understand. He said, who can understand his errors? You can't. You can't understand your own errors. I can't understand my own errors. I can't see the defects in my life. Uh, there are, you know, things that are in every life. There's not a one of us that doesn't have things in our life that God uh, wants to take out that we don't see. And the way to see them is by having the Holy Spirit to help us to understand. And the more of the Spirit of God we have, the more we feel a need for Jesus, the more the Bible comes alive, the more we can understand the things of God, the more we can uh, be guided by him in, in, in all kinds of decisions that we have to make, uh, big decisions, little decisions, where to go to school, where to work, who to marry, um, a, a lot of things. And there's just everything, you know, how to, uh, how to be good at our jobs, uh, whatever it is, uh, and ultimately, how important Jesus is to us. How valuable is the cross? How valuable is what the Lamb of God did when he died for the sins of the world and paid the price for our sins? We cannot know these things. We can't understand these things. Um, they can't really reach our hearts if we don't have the Holy Spirit. Now, let me read a couple of uh, few sentences from this book, The Desire of Ages. Many of you have seen this book. This is the book that actually changed my life. I've read it many times. I actually, in my car, the car that I have right now, I have had for over 20 years. And it, it still has an audio cassette player in it. When I travel around and I I, I, I get rental cars. Uh, they don't have audio cassette players anymore. They don't even have CD players because now everything's MP3 and, you know, technology has advanced. But the car that Steve Wahlberg drives still has an audio cassette player. And I still have an old set of Desire of Ages, the book Desire of Ages, read on audio cassette. And I've listened to it so many times in my car and I'm actually going through it again. I think I'm on somewhere around chapter, I don't know, chapter 10 or chapter 11. So I love this book. And here's a quote from page 672 about the Holy Spirit. It says, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church. And the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. But like every other promise, it is given upon conditions. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet they receive no benefit. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit of God, through the Spirit, God works in his people to do and to, to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. And this is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. That's powerful. I'll read that again. Only to those who wait humbly upon God. See, and that's the problem with Laodicea. Uh, they, they think, and they're rich and increase with goods and in need of nothing. They don't need to wait humbly upon God because they think they've got everything. That's why they need the eyes out. They need their eyes opened to the truth. Uh, only those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and their reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train. Desire of Ages, page 672. So whatever blessings we need in life, it starts with the Holy Spirit. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit is our greatest need. Because when we really have the Holy Spirit, then everything else follows. Uh, then we can understand the Bible. Then we can know our, our condition and, and our need for a Savior. 
then we can know the preciousness of Christ and his love for us. We can know how much he loves other people, not just me or you, but other people too. He loves them as well, just as much as he loves us. And we can then detect the workings of the devil and his subtle, uh, his subtlety. Uh, I got a, um, an email just a few days ago from a man that claimed to be a literary agent. And he uh, said that his team of, uh, of expert publishing people had found my book, uh, The Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast, and they were so impressed with it. And, and uh, this man was reaching out to me to um, propose that he become my literary agent and, uh, and to help take the book and bring it before traditional publishers, big publishers, and uh, try to get my book into the mainstream of the Christian world. And uh, I, I called him and we started having a conversation and he said many different things to me. And then he told me uh, that he, that the cost for me to be involved with him as a literary agent would be about $1,500. And he said that he was so impressed with my book that he would like to, uh, he would pay 500 of that himself. And he just knows that he can get, you know, possibly millions of sales from this book. And uh, all, all I needed to do was cough up $1,000. And he, had a, he sent me to his website with testimonials and various things. And, uh, and then he said, you know, this is the end of, my, uh, the, end of the month, and I'm, laying, I'm, I'm picking my acquisitions for the next season, and I've, I'm only going to take five. I've already got four, and I've got one more slot, and it's yours. So are you ready to sign a contract with me, Steve Wahlberg? And we'll start pushing your book and getting it to the big, the big boys, and it'll only cost you $1,089. And so um, he said, I'll give it to you tomorrow to make a decision. And last night I went online, and probably I should have known this before, but I went online and I did some real deep digging about his company, about him and different things, and I came to the conclusion uh, that this was a scam that this man was just trying to take my money. There was, his, his name is not associated with any literary agency anywhere on the web. And there were a lot of other red flags. And the more I thought about it, what was happening in my mind was the Holy Spirit was convicting me, steer clear. Don't get involved with this man. He's a scam artist. He's trying to take you for a ride, take your money. He can't deliver. And, uh, and I believe that the Lord guided my study and convicted me so that I wouldn't be taken by this man. Um, and I've had other people that have tried to scam me. And, uh, you know, we all need, what we need is the Holy Spirit to help us to discern is, if something is a deception or if it really is something, something true and good. And we all need that. Okay, I've got one more verse I want to share with you. And then we will open it up to questions. Uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. This is a simple verse. It is a mighty verse and is a promise from Jesus. Luke 11, verse 13. Let's look at this carefully. Jesus said, if you then, and I think in some of your Bibles, if you read in the King James Bible, it'll say ye, if ye then. My Bible says, if you then. And, and for, first point is, I think, I know that Jesus wants us to apply these words to ourselves. He says, if you then, and so when I read, if you then, you is not you, but me. So I need to apply this to myself. Jesus said, if you then being evil, now that's not very flattering. Jesus doesn't flatter us. He loves us, but he tells us the truth. And in this verse, he says that, that we are by nature, we are evil. And if you, if you look at the word evil, all you need to do is add one more letter before the E and you get, you get a devil. Uh, and I've, I've been convicted of this, that without Jesus, I am a human devil, or at least I'm under the control of the devil without the Lord. And so God has convicted me that without Jesus, I am, I am evil. That's my nature. I'm naturally selfish. Uh, I'm naturally, I naturally go in the wrong direction. And, and it's, it's not flattering. I know in this world where people 
Talk about how important it is that you feel good about yourself. Uh, and and I, I believe God wants us to feel good about ourselves. But there's a, there's a path to feeling good about yourself. And that path is, first of all, accepting what Jesus says about ourselves. And that's the path to coming to know him and finding that peace of mind. So if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, just because we're evil doesn't mean there's, there's no good in us. There is some good in us still. We're all a blend of good and evil. We're a, we're a mixture of, uh, you know, somebody once said, there's a lot of, there's good in the worst of us, and there's bad in the best of us. And isn't that so true? So even though we're evil, we still know how to give good gifts to our children. I definitely do. I love my kids. My wife loves my, my ch our children, uh, Seth and Abby, and there's nothing we want more than to give good things to our kids. So Jesus said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more show the contrast is between us who are evil, who still can give good things to our kids, how much more, Jesus says, shall your heavenly Father, now our heavenly Father is not evil. He's only good. He's perfectly good. He's completely unselfish through and through. He only wants what's best for his, uh, his children, for everything that he has made. And isn't that a wonderful thought that we serve a God who is not evil, but who is good and who loves us and who wants what's best for us? Praise the Lord. How much more shall your heavenly Father give? And what does Jesus say the Father wants to give us? The Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So Jesus is specifically saying that uh, this fantastic gift that the Father, who is perfect, wants to give us his children, even though we're evil, is the Holy Spirit. It's his spirit. That's the gift. That's what he longs to give us. And he knows that if we will receive that gift, like it says in Desire of Ages, every other blessing will follow in its train. All the other things that we need in this life, um, whatever we need, we might, he, God may not give us everything we want, but he'll give us what we need. And what we really need is his spirit to help us to understand. And so I just want to appeal to you as you look at this verse. Uh, it says to them that ask him. And that's where we have to do our part. As I mentioned, in 1986, I went through a terrible crisis. This was many years ago. I still remember it. But it was very, uh, it was dark. And I was struggling and battling with myself and with the devil and with sin and with temptation and I was on the edge of my life and I prayed a desperate prayer I said God what do I do what do I do you've got to help me I'm at the end of my rope and this little voice spoke to my conscience and the little voice said pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth which is a quote from John 16 verse 13 and I've actually got, got that verse on my desk at my office upstairs uh, in, on a wooden plaque. Somebody heard me talk about this and, and engraved a wooden plaque and put it on a stand with the verse, John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I've got that right on my desk. It's there every day when I sit at my office in front of my computer. And I tell you, it's been such a blessing to me. I decided to pray that prayer, to ask God for the Holy Spirit, to plead with him for the Holy Spirit. And little by little by little, from that day until this, he has continued to put my life together. He's blessed me. He's given me uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful wife, two children, uh, two beautiful teenage children. We're not a perfect family. We do have our struggles and trials just like anybody else. But I'm a blessed man. I know I'm a blessed man. And my life has changed because of that decision that I made to pray for the Holy Spirit to come into my life. And I just want to appeal to you from me, Steve Wahlberg, to you, 
to, if you haven't been doing this, to, to do it, to do what Jesus said. He said, ask. So that's where your part comes in. That's where you need to get on your knees on a regular basis. And when you go to bed, when you get up in the morning, roll over on your bed and pray for the Holy Spirit. When you go to bed at night, roll over on your bed or kneel down by your bed and pray for the Holy Spirit. If you're a family man and you have family worship like, like uh, my family does, morning and evening, pray for the Holy Spirit. If you're in a struggle, dealing with some kind of sin that you're battling with, pray for the Holy Spirit. If it's hard for you to understand the Bible, if you're uh, trying to understand the book of Revelation or Bible prophecy or the life of Jesus and you're having a hard time, pray for the Holy Spirit. If you feel like your life is, is kind of formal, you know, you go to church, you pray your prayers, uh, you sing the songs, but there's just something missing, something missing inside of you, pray for the Holy Spirit. If you need uh, help in some big decision in your life that you're facing, pray for the Holy Spirit. Uh, I can't tell you what it will do for you. Desire of Ages says every other blessing will come from that. Jesus said, anoint your eyes with eye salve so you can see. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we can't see. If I don't have my glasses, I I can't read this Bible. And if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I am not able to understand the things of God. And the Holy Spirit also in Galatians 5 says uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. God wants us to have love, joy, peace, happiness. He does want us to feel good. He made us to feel good. He doesn't want us to feel you know, miserable all the time. Uh, but we do need to be convicted where we need convicting and we do need to uh, repent of our sins and realize our sins. That's the bitter part before we can find uh, the joy. That's just the way it is. There's no other way. So we need to go down in order to come up. So uh, I just encourage you to do what Jesus says. And if you, if you think, well, you know, I'm too bad. I don't think the Lord's going to hear my prayer. That's not true. Jesus says, even though you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your kids or to people that you know and love, uh, how much more, much, much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? This is his promise. So if you do your part, if you do your part and ask, he will do his part and he will give. You ask, he gives. Got it? You ask, he gives. So start asking. Uh, do this. Uh, I think we should do it every day. I've learned that uh, the Holy Spirit is a wonderful thing. It's, he, he doesn't want to hurt me. He's not going to um, make my life miserable. He's going to improve my life. He's going to ennoble my life. He's going to make me better, a better man, a better dad, a better husband, a better minister, a better speaker, a better writer, a better friend, a better gardener, uh, you know, whatever I need to deal with in my life. So let's have a prayer and then I will take your questions. We've got time for questions. We've got about 20 minutes. So let's, let's just pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, how we need Jesus and how we need the Holy Spirit. Our greatest need is for God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit helps us to, um, to have a relationship with you. So we, we just pray as a group. People have, they're tuning in. They're, uh, they're in their homes. Their heads are bowed. Their eyes are closed. And Lord, we just pray, give us the Holy Spirit. Please help us in our lives. Give us much more of the Spirit of God so Everything else that you want to give us can come to us. Please bless this group. Bless me. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, praise the Lord. All right. Well, I'm ready for some questions. Uh, looking at the chat, somebody said, amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So what do we got here? Let's see. Carla, in Genesis 1 verse 2, when it says that the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, was that the Holy Spirit and did he help create the world as well? Uh, my opinion is yes. 
you know, that's just, that's the second verse in the Bible. And it doesn't really say more than what it says, but it certainly does say that, the, that at the beginning of the world, the Holy Spirit was there. Yes, it was the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is referred to in different ways in the Bible. It's called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter. Uh, there are many different phrases that apply to the Holy Spirit. So I believe that Genesis 1 verse 2 is referring to the Holy Spirit. I believe that he was involved in the creation of the world uh, to some extent, but we don't know the details, and I don't know if we need to know the details. We can ask the Lord when we get to heaven. So uh, that's what I believe, that yes, the Holy Spirit was at the beginning of the Bible, and when you look at Revelation 22, where we already read verse 17, the Holy Spirit says, come, so he's at the beginning of the Bible, and he's at the end of the Bible, and he was certainly on Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down. He led Jesus into the wilderness. He's in the book of Revelation. He inspired the entire Bible. The Spirit of, the Spirit of God inspired the book of God because he inspired, it says, holy men as they uh, spoke by the Holy Spirit. So I hope that answers your question, Carla. That's my belief. Okay, let's see. Next question, Lewis. Is it wrong to stock up on provisions before the no buy sell period? I don't think so. I don't think it's wrong to have a pantry, to have uh, some things laid up, but we do need to realize that there's going to come a time. So I, I think when the early time of trouble comes and nobody can buy or sell, if you do have some uh, provisions that these can be very valuable to you and and they can also be something that you can give to other people if uh, if they're in dire straits but as that time goes deeper toward the final time of trouble uh, ultimately there's going to be a time when we have to completely disconnect from any earthly support uh, and I believe that we're going to, at that point, we're going to be like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and God fed them with manna. So God is going to take care of his people during the, during the final time of trouble. And we're also told that uh, when, the, when that final time comes, if we do have provisions, you know, the, the wicked will probably take them. So I think, so bottom line is, I believe that having some things stored up can be valuable for a while, but not. But they're not going to. They're not going to bring us all the way through. Uh, when we get into the deep point of the time of trouble, our reliance must be on God alone, and not on anything that we've grown, or um, canned, or put into our pantries. So. That's, that's what I believe. So I have, we have a, a room upstairs in this building that has some, some peaches and pears uh, and some apples and things that are in jars. Um, I have a bag of lentils upstairs that I, I grow sprouts and um, lentils last for a long time. And if things get really tight, I can always sprout lentils and there's a lot of protein in lentils. So. That's what I'm doing, but I have no, um, uh, no illusion that those kind of things are going to provide for me all the way until the coming of Jesus. I don't believe that. So mm, that's, my, that's my take. Oh, and you have to do what your conscience tells you to do. Okay, next, uh, next question. Okay, Bridge Across the Storm International. How would you, how should we explain the Godhead to monotheistic religious people like Muslims and Jews? 
Uh, that that's a that's a good question. It's a tough question. Well, the Bible does. The Bible says different things. Uh, in in Deuteronomy, you, you you can say to people, to Jews and to Muslims, that we believe the Bible. And Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy six. Very famous statement about what the Israelites were to believe. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So this is a famous line, that God is one. And you can tell Jews and Muslims that as a Christian, uh, you believe in Deuteronomy 6, you believe the Bible, you believe in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, that says the Lord is one. So we believe in one Lord. But you can also show from the same Bible uh, things like this. The word one in Genesis, and it's the same word, the same Hebrew word, ekad. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, therefore, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cling to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So it's the same word. The Lord is one, and the word is ikad. And this verse says uh, that a man and a woman, when they're united in marriage, they are one. But it's obvious in this text that the word one means two who are united in one. And there's another verse uh, in the book of 1 John, Chapter 5, verse 7, that says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, who is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So just like in uh, Genesis, there's two that are one. So this verse says there's three that are one. Now, we do believe in that the Lord is one. But the question is, is that one just a singular, solitary being? Or can two become one and three become one. Now, I would also say to somebody like, to a Jewish person or a, uh, a Muslim that, that we don't understand everything about God. Uh, there's a verse in, let me see, I just was actually quoting this today to somebody. Job, where's the book of Job? Chapter 7, verse 11. Do I have that right? Maybe that's not the right verse. Somewhere in the book of Job, it says, who by searching can find out God? Let me just do a quick, uh, quick internet search for that. Who by searching can find out God? Job 711. Huh. Is that what I've got here? I don't know why that is. The internet says, Job 7.11 says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? But that's not correct. Let's see, Job 7. Oh, there we go. Where is that? A set, oh, it's Job 11, 7 to 9. That verse that I saw was not correct. The real, the, the correct one, there it is, is Job 11, verse 7, not 7, 11, but uh, 11, 7 says, Can you by searching find out God? Can you find out the Almighty to perfection? It is as high as heaven. What can you do? It is deeper than hell. What can you know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. So I would tell people that inquire that there are certain things about God that we, they're just beyond us. We cannot, by searching, find out God. So, but what we can do is we can believe what the Bible says, what he's revealed to us. And the Bible's very clear. Uh, there are verses that say, like there's a verse in 1 Timothy 2.5 that says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, which is the man Christ Jesus. So the Bible does say there's one God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 uh, says the Lord is one. And yet, in Genesis 2.24, two become one. And in 1 John 5, 7, there are three that are united in one. I understand that to be unity, 
not, um, it doesn't mean that they, that the Father is the Son and that the Holy Spirit is the Father. Uh, it means that they are three united in one. So I believe in one God, but I also believe that there are three united in one. And that's as far as I go because, you know, the, that's what the Bible says. And I can't go beyond that because I cannot, by searching, find out God. I just have to, have to accept what he says. Uh, and that's where my book, Satan's War Against the Godhead, comes in. If you're interested in going deeper into this topic, there's a lot of information in this book that I think is very, very valuable. It's very biblical. And it lets the Bible speak. And then it says, beyond what the Bible says, tread softly. Don't claim to know what you don't know. In fact, there's a, another verse that uh, has really spoken to me. 1 Timothy 1, verse 7. This is a powerful text. 1 Timothy 1, 7 talks about some people who desire to be teachers of the law, but they understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And my Bible on the, in the margin says, nor whereof they speak positively. So whether it's teachers of the law or teachers of the, of, um, about God or teachers about many things, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a whole lot of humans out there in many religions, in all religions, who so often speak very positively about things that they really know nothing about. And that's what this text is about. Uh, they, they neither understand what they say nor what they so confidently affirm. And so that tells us that we should tread softly. We should hesitate to be so dogmatic and so certain about things that we really don't completely understand. So that's why I believe that uh, humility is the, the proper path for us humans and that we should rely on the word of God uh, above the teachings of men and what God doesn't explain, let's leave with him and say, I just stop with the Bible. I don't have all the answers. So you can tell your Jewish friends and your Muslim friends that we don't have all the answers, but we do believe in the Bible. We do believe in what God says. And hopefully that will appeal to your friend's conscience, that that's the proper posture to take. And again, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in because the Holy Spirit can help us to see that so often we say things that we don't understand. And we, we speak positively about things that we really don't know. And so the Holy Spirit can convict us to uh, close our mouths and to be more humble and to tread softly and to lift up the Lord and depend on what he says rather than what we think. So that's part of what the Holy Spirit has taught me. Okay, next question. Okay, I want, okay, Antonio said, I want to get your book about the Trinity. Can I get it at the ABC? I live in College Dale, Tennessee. I think so. Uh, this book was printed by Pacific Press and they took, uh, 2,000 copies. They sent White Horse Media 2,000 copies. So we've got them. Uh, they're not a very expensive book. I think it's like $5, $4.95, so it's not expensive. But if you would rather it, get it get it from your local uh, ABC, Satan's War Against the Godhead, just call, call the ABC and say, do you have Satan's War Against the Godhead by Steve Wahlberg? And if they don't have it, uh, they can certainly order it for you because they can get it from Pacific Press. And no Pacific Press goal is to get these books into ABCs across the country. So it should be available. Uh, and if you can't find it from anybody, if you're overseas right now listening to this in Australia or the Philippines or Thailand, uh, you should be able to go on to Amazon and you should be able to find the book uh, as, as an ebook. And I believe, Jeff, maybe you can put our, our uh, ebook website up there. We, you can also go to whitehorsemedia.com uh, or there it is, whitehorsemediaebooks.com, I'm sorry. whitehorsemediaebooks.com and see what we have available as an ebook. So hopefully that uh, answers the question. Okay, next question. What else do we have? C 
coming in anymore. Okay, uh, how can I know if I'm following Jesus' will or following my own way? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I would say pray for the Holy Spirit <laughs> because then you'll know, you'll know more, or at least you'll, you'll know more than you do. Uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't want to go our own way. We want to follow God's way, but sometimes it is. Uh, the waters are muddy. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate. Am I doing this on my own or is this the leading of the Lord? And I do believe that when we fully surrender to God, that our life gets better. Our life improves. Uh, we, we can make better decisions. So sometimes we're afraid to give everything to God and go his way because we're afraid that if we do that, uh, we're not going to be happy or we're going to have to give up the things that, that make us happy. But that's not true. Uh, there is no real happiness in going our own way. Real happiness comes from going, uh, going God's way. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So he, here's, here's my answer to you. Uh, what does it say? Why, why Ramosi? I don't know exactly how to say that. But he, here's my best answer. Is read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, which means all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So the, what we want is for God to direct us. And, but we have to fulfill the condition, which means, which says, uh, we have to trust him with all our hearts. And in all of our ways, we need to acknowledge him. So whatever way we go, uh, and there's a lot of ways that, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variety in this world. There's many uh, options and, and uh, God's will does not restrict us unnecessarily to a path that will cripple us. God's will is for is broad. And so if God is in the center of our lives, he'll he'll lead us in the best way uh, for us and that will apply to, you know, many different things, your job, your marriage, your relationships with others, your your homework, your schooling, <coughs> in all kinds of decisions. God is quite capable of leading us in all these different areas of our lives. So that would be my, uh, and I think that, uh, that the more you pray for the Holy Spirit and the more you ask God to direct your paths, you'll be able to discern more and more if you are following Jesus' will or just your own way. And if it's just your own way, then you, you know, you adjust. <laughs> Say, Lord, if this isn't your way, help me to go this way. And God will teach you as you pray for the Holy Spirit. Okay, any more questions? What else do we have, Jeff? Uh, we're getting ready to wind this down. Okay, Andrew says, If a man was a Christian once but stopped being active after Vietnam and lived like the world until now, would God ever take him back and forgive him? I, I say 100% yes for sure. As long as you feel your need. Uh, the only reason why God doesn't take somebody back is because they don't want to come back. They don't have a desire to come back. If you have a, if you're talking about yourself or somebody else, if it's you, and if you have a desire to come back, that desire was put in you by the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the sense of need for God in the first place comes from him. So, you don't have to worry that you've gone too far. If you are thinking about coming back to him and if you want to come back to him, that's a perfect indication that God is drawing you back to him. And you know, you look at Bible history, Moses was a murderer, David was an adulterer and a murderer. Uh, people, you know, you look at the history of Manasseh, and different people in the Bible that just did terrible things. Paul, Saul, was a, uh, a persecutor and a blasphemy, blasphemer. And the Lord turned his life around and made him Paul, took Saul and made him Paul. So there's no sin that you can commit that uh, 
is too, too bad for the Lord to forgive, except for one, and that is the total rejection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, but again, if you feel, if you feel like you're, if you're worried about committing that sin, you haven't committed it because people that have committed it don't worry about it. If, you're, if you want to be forgiven and come back to God, that's a sign that the Lord is working in your life. And he's big enough to take you and me and whoever we are and uh, show us the abundance of his grace and his love and save sinners from sin. So don't be discouraged. No matter what you've done, there's hope for us all. Okay, let's see, any more? I think we can probably make one more and then I've got, a, actually I've got an appointment in 15 minutes. I'm not gonna go anywhere, I'm just gonna sit right here and do a click and be online with, with a, a friend. Is Pro okay, Proverbs 8, 12 was wisdom the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 8, 12. I think I know what this, yeah, this is a whole chapter about, about wisdom. Um, wisdom is actually personified in this chapter. There's, there's a, like in verse one, it says, does wisdom, cry, does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth, put forth her voice. So wisdom and understanding are, uh, represented as a woman in this chapter, her voice. And then, then it talks about how uh, she cries at the gates. So this is the way the Bible does this. The Bible does refer to uh, wisdom as a woman. Uh, verse 12 says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and I find out knowledge and witty inventions. So all we can do is just read it and conclude that in Proverbs 8, God does personify wisdom in the, uh, as a female. But that doesn't mean that God is a woman. It just means that in this chapter, that's what the Lord does. So, uh, and, and is it the Holy Spirit? Uh, well, this, the Bible talks about the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of understanding and the spirit of truth who guides you into all truth. So I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a woman, but I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit gives wisdom. Uh, the Bible also says that um, Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God, but Jesus isn't a woman. Uh, but again, the Bible does personify uh, wisdom in this chapter and the Holy Spirit gives wisdom. So. I guess that's the best I can do. Well, you know, some things we'll have to just wait and uh, have the Lord clarify these things when we get to heaven. So I think we're, uh, I think we're done. It's been about an hour. It's about as long as I like to go. Um, thank you all for being with us. I hope this has been a big blessing to you. I hope that you will pray for the Holy Spirit. Hope you'll pray for us at Whitehorse Media. Uh, we just appreciate those that pray for us. We appreciate those who um, go on to our YouTube channel, who like and support and share, uh, make comments. And uh, if you, you know, feel impressed by the Lord to give to Whitehorse Media, we have a whole team here. I'm in a building, I'm in a studio. We have offices upstairs and downstairs. We have a whole staff here and everything uh, costs something. We all know life uh, costs things. Some things are free, but some things cost. And so we have salaries, we have, uh, uh, a video editor, a producer, an audio engineer, an IT man. Uh, we have people that answer phones. We have uh, a bookkeeper. We have a, uh, a man that does our um, accounting. So a lot of uh, moving parts in this ministry. And if, if it wasn't for our supporters, uh, we wouldn't be here. So we deeply appreciate all the contributions that come our way. So uh, let's have one more prayer and then we'll, we'll call it uh, an evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful time that we can study the Bible. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Even though we don't understand everything, there's a lot we don't understand. Help us not to uh, speak positively about things that we just really don't understand. There's a mystery to the things of God that go beyond our small 
little minds, but we can know a lot, and we can know more than we know if we will look to you and let you teach us and guide us. So give us all your Holy Spirit, guide us in the path that we should walk on in these last days. Uh, help us to be good influences on others, to reveal Christ to them, to draw people to Jesus, and to be a blessing to as many as possible as we wait for the coming of our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. Uh, God bless you. We'll do this again. Ne next week I won't be here. I'll be at 3 a.m. doing some recording. And actually the following Thursday I'll be in Holland. So I'm going to the Netherlands for a week to speak there and to uh, do a little bit of traveling. And so uh, I won't be back for another three weeks, but... Um, We've got a lot of things on our YouTube channel. We have new videos on our YouTube channel that are very powerful. We hope that you'll watch them. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Keep the faith. Keep looking to Jesus. And don't forget, pray for the Holy Spirit. Okay, bye for now.